it's a pleasure uh, to be hosting uh, Yun Sun, the director of uh, the China program at the Stimson Center. Thank you very much for joining us at the Africa Center. Thank you for having me. Now we're going to talk about uh, One Belt, One Road. Um, huge initiative, um, lots of money. Uh, according to the World Bank, uh, it's now touching over 60% of the world population. Uh, economic corridors, six economic corridors extending from China through Asia to, um, to Africa as well as maritime corridor linking East and, and West Africa. Now, with over 1,700 projects uh, involved in One Belt, One Road, and close to $900 billion, most of which is uh, debt financing, mm -hmm. there have been a number of complaints by African countries in particular about uh, some of the debt arrangements. There's a concern that they're getting into too much debt. Mm. We've had issues in Kenya, with the railway, uh, the Nairobi uh, uh, Mombasa railway, we've had uh, issues in uh, Djibouti, uh, problems of uh, of, uh, of debt uh, sustainability, and recently uh, the president of Tanzania uh, complained about the uh, debt uh, arrangements um, for the Bagamoyo Megaport uh, project. Um, China hosted uh, back in April hosted the second Belt and Road Forum for international cooperation. Um, what, in your opinion, in your view, um, is the Chinese government doing, or how might the Chinese government react to some of these uh, criticisms and complaints from its African partners? Uh, I think there are complaints from different sources, but the complaints that primarily came from African governments about the debt sustainability or about the uh, refinancing of some of the debt or the loan repayment terms. I think the Chinese government approach is to renegotiate to the ability that they can. And we have seen such renegotiation, for example, happened in the case of the Ethiopia to Djibouti uh, high-speed railway. Well, not really high-speed, but it's a railway project. So they were able to renegotiate the loan repayment terms from uh, 30 year, uh, I'm sorry, 10 years to a 30 year period. And Sano Shore, uh, the Chinese insurance company, actually had to pay a pretty high price for that renegotiation. So that's on the government level. I think to the extent that, that they can, the Chinese government renegotiates the terms. But I think for the criticism coming out of, uh, for example, civil society organizations, and for example, environmental organizations or the labor rights organizations, I think that's a much bigger problem associated with the Chinese practice on the uh, on the on the ground, and there are problematic behaviors and acti uh, activities associated with the Chinese uh, loan projects and the Chinese investment projects, but that will require almost the African society and the African population to take a more um, Closer scrutiny of the Chinese um, Chinese projects in their in their own country, but coming back to the debt sustainability problem, I think one reaction that we hear a lot from the Chinese bankers and from the Chinese officials is that a decision eventually lies with the African government mm -hmm. to borrow, to lend is only one side of the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is a, a calling or a need for the African governments to be more. Um, disciplined coming to their borrowing from China as well. The Chinese will make the loans, will make the financing available wherever they can, but whether the, gov the African governments have been making the best decision to take on the loans at certain terms, I think that's an African question. It's not just a Chinese question. Right. Now, you've been covering uh, China-Africa relations for a long time, and you're very familiar with these issues. Uh, a number of policy initiatives were adopted after the Belt and Road Forum uh, to address uh, the issue of debt sustainability. To what extent are those initiatives working? And um, are they having any impact in the nature of the relationship? One thing that we know for sure is that Belt and Road was first um, initiated or proposed in late 2013. And between 2013 and 2017, when the first Belt and Road Forum was held in Beijing, it was more of an exploratory stage. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese term for that stage is, uh, they call it impressionist. Right. That Belt and Road was a concept, but was a concept that really means, depends on how people interpret it, and how people try to portray what projects and what uh, Belt and Road really meant. 
But I think from 2017 to 2019, is a stage where we see the early harvest projects of Belt and Road being completed, and some of them went into operation. And that's where the economic sustainability of this uh, issue, of these projects, really became a, a very much bigger issue for both China as a lender and for the African countries as a borrowers. So I think in the 2019, um, the second Belt and Road Forum actually represent a watershed uh, event mm -hmm. in China's Belt and Road process, mm -hmm. which is um, in, in the sense that um, starting from the second Belt and Road Forum, Chinese central government made it clear that the first stage of being exploratory, uh, exploratory and impressionist and interpretive of BRI is over. And now we're going to be more cautious and more calculating and more tidy coming to the financial requirement for the projects, the environmental and the social impact of the projects, and the regulation, the decision making related to the, to the loan decisions by the Chinese policy banks have become much more stringent than before. So now when we see an African government goes to Beijing and try to get loan for a certain project, or they are, uh, or they do that in a uh, coalition with, uh, say, Chinese state-owned enterprises to jointly apply for funding. Um, we see that the decision has become much more uh, time-consuming and much more, uh, much, much more difficult compared to before. Okay. Now, would you attribute this to uh, the recent um, uh, debt sustainability policy framework uh, released by the Ministry of Commerce? I think the framework is a part of this decision. So instead of being the cause of this decision, I think the framework has been designed as a Chinese government response to this not only African but global outcry of China creating debt traps everywhere. And honestly, the Chinese decision making is not a monolithic process, right? We see that Chinese state-owned enterprises as the contractors of the infrastructure projects try to enlarge the project as much as possible because they get paid. And we see the Chinese policy banks trying to follow the central government decision to absorb the overcapacity and try to promote the export of the Chinese service. So their goals are also different from the Chinese central government, which has to ma manage different political, economic, and security relations. So we do see that this, uh, this debt trap narrative has been um, blossoming almost in everywhere, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Africa. But whether it was Beijing, the central government's decision to create these traps to, be, to begin with, I think there are very different analysis. And in my opinion, I don't think it was their intention to create the dead traps. But the process and the proliferation of the Chinese actors in the process creates the end, uh, the end result that a lot of these countries do face a debt sustainability problem with Beijing. Mm -hmm. And that's why the central government in China is trying to uh, trying to counter that problem with a framework and with other policy designs. Right, with other policy designs. Now, we've looked at it from the Chinese uh, government perspective. Let's take a step back and look at what's happening on the African continent. To what extent are these policy shifts affecting uh, African strategies uh, with regard to negotiating uh, these, uh, these uh, debts? And also in terms of the larger China-Africa uh, economic and security relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the first question is availability of the Chinese financing, right? right. Uh, between 2015 for CAC and 2018 for CAC, China did not increase the amount of financing mm -hmm. pledges that they made to African continent, which in the past had been doubling or tripling in the past, uh, in the since 2006, so in the past uh, 10 years or the 15 years. So we are seeing that the Chinese financing is not necessarily increasing in the case of uh, African continent. And then on the bilateral level, when African governments try to go to Beijing and seek funding, I think the questions that they are faced with are much more comprehensive than, than before. Mm -hmm. So this will almost force African governments to become more disciplined and responsible when they're trying to take out loans from, uh, from, other, from other lenders. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the case of, uh, of Tanzania. Um, Tanzania in the case of the foreign borrowing. Well, China is not only the 
is not the only debtor. And the, the Tanzanian government has been borrowing from, for example, the euro bond market yeah. and from other international multilateral development banks as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's a more comprehensive picture, but I understand that China is very easy to be the, ta to be the target because China's, um, for its own financing decisions, is not disciplined enough to, to begin with. So I think for the African government, um, African governments to make use of um, the Chinese financing and the Chinese assistance to their future economic development, I think more attention should be paid to the industrial capacity cooperation, which is to stimulate, aimed at the stimulation of the uh, urban, well, the industrialization and urbanization in, in African countries, and at the same time also facilitate the employment of the young, uh, of the youth population. So that's something that the Chinese has been proposing as a part of their BRI in Africa, but I don't see a lot of African governments actually enthusiastic, enthusiastically or actively exploiting on that on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's just so much easier to focus on the infrastructure financing and taking out loans out of the Chinese policy banks. Mm -hmm. So for the future sustainable development of African continent, I think all leaders understand they need to create more jobs, they need to go for industrialization. And since that is something that the Chinese do emphasize that is something that they offer to the African governments, I think our African governments should exploit on that opportunity. Okay. And uh, now finally, um, one of the things that we've seen as the Belt and Road has taken off is, uh, is, a, is an increase in uh, engagement by African academics, policy experts, mm. uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society institutions. So the mm. Africa-China story is no longer just limited to government-to-government -government, uh, relationships. What would be your recommendations to African civil society organizations as they continue to engage, for instance, on security issues such as the uh, the base in, uh, in, in Djibouti and the military programs that China is running, mm. as well as the economic uh, issues? What would be your... Um, your recommendations in terms of the prospects, uh, uh, you know, to influence that a larger relationship? Yeah, I think the Chinese government has taken a very particular approach towards soft power influence in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. And they do realize that in the process of their economic engagement with Africa, um, civil society organizations usually appear as, uh, well, as a noise, as a troublemaker from the Chinese perspective. Mm -hmm because they scrutinize the logic or the accountability or the transparency of the Chinese projects and raise questions. And in the process, civil society organizations and media, in many cases that we have seen, have revealed almost a darker side of the, of the Chinese economic story in, uh, in Africa. So I think the Chinese, on one hand, they feel that, well, there is a misunderstanding there, that the African me media or the civil society do not, compre do not completely understand the Chinese approach. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I think that there's also a conscious effort, a decision made in Beijing, that we need to bring Africans to China to show them this, the miracle of our economic success and to show them that what Africa could achieve if they continue to have economic engagement with China, and also get the, what the Chinese would like to call free ride with China's economic success. But in reality, it's not really free. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for the African, um, the soft power influence that China is trying to project in, in Africa is a conscious decision, and it's a decision made at the top level. And since the Chinese government is making the budget available for such soft power campaigns, then we do see uh, universities, academic institutions, mm -hmm. media, um, almost all sorts of organizations trying to carry out that campaign. But what is curious to see is that how African, for example, civil society or media or opinion leaders have been responding mm -hmm. to, to that Chinese soft power uh, influence. So, for example, uh, we know that the Chinese have been bringing scholars, students, to China under the Chinese government-sponsored scholarship or fellowship. So do these students grow up with, uh, with a necessarily a cultural affinity towards China? Well, they probably grow up with um, or go through their study in China with much of a more commercial affinity towards China because they learn the language, they get a lot of opportunities in, along the way. But if we ask African civil society organizations that if you do, uh, whether you do believe that the Chinese projects in your country is problem free, 
I don't think the Chinese soft power has had that impact at all. So my, my advice to the civil society organizations and media leaders, opinion leaders in Africa, in their dealing with China is always to ask whether there is another side to the, to the same story. Um, and also remember that the, coming back to Chinese projects in Africa, accountability and uh, transparency are two issues that the Chinese projects are not famous for. So I think when we look at the numbers, that seems to be glorious that China is investing this much, or China is supporting this glorious projects in, in, in a certain African country. I think the, the good question to ask is always, so what's behind it? What does that mean for the, for example, the debt implication for the country? What does China get out of it? Because um, in, the, in the Chinese approach to, to Africa, it's not, it's not philanthropy. It's, uh, it's a win-win, right? So China also has to win in the, in the game. So to assume that China is doing Africa favors altruistically is, uh, is uh, erroneous perception. Well, a definitely erroneous perception, uh, but thank you very much. This has been a very useful discussion. Thank you. Uh, we've been very, very happy to have you here. Um, happy to be here. Yun Sun, director of the uh, China program at the Stimson Center, thank you very, very much uh, for thank your time. You, Paul.